Manani Yopacharya and distinguished friends in the audience. It pleases me a great deal to deliver this first Ramkinga lecture and that too in Shantaniketan, to which place he was deeply attached. When I went to Baroda to teach in 1951, in a rather novel and innovative art institution, I was told by its dean that he had come specially to Shantaniketan to persuade Ram Kinka to move to his institution, promising him every kind of facility he needed. But he had locked it away by saying that Shantaniketan was his astana or the root space. It might have changed through the years, but his original ties with the place were still live and green in his mind. I had the good fortune of having Ramkinka as one of my teachers when I studied in Kalagona from 1944 to 1948. But through these four years he had become more of a solicitor's associate to me than a teacher to the extent that when I was leaving the ashram he was sentimental and came to the railway station to see me off. But this was not so special. This should have been within the experience of many other students as well. I came close to him soon after I joined Kalabhavana due to various circumstances and he started asking me to accompany him on his frequent sketching trips to the countryside around. It was a great experience. Those days, this countryside was not much to talk about. Especially to a person from Kerala used to lush tropical scenery. Here the land was largely arid and its details miniature. But even from this rag back of a landscape, Ram Kinka could pick out the interesting vistas to celebrate in his sketches. As an inexperienced novice, I did more watching than sketching and heard his occasional comments about the scene in front, about the problems of reading and representing it, about the artist's objective. In other words, about the images and the intentions. So I thought that my lecture will do well to carry this caption, Images and Intentions, taking it a little beyond its original premises. For between 1940s and today, the world art scene has undergone many changes in images and intentions in almost every sector of practice. So such an extension is inevitable. But I will start the lecture with a brief description of Ram Kinker's own methods of work. Ram Kinker's landscape sketches were a little different from the kind of watercolor landscape produced in the official art schools of that time. We tried to correspond in some way or the other to the photographic or retinal image with an emphasis on some mode of atmospheric detail like prominent chiaroscuro or impressionistic color. Ramkinka's intention was in a sense similar to that of Paul Cezanne, the influential French painter, to project a motif or extract a motif from nature or seen reality. In his watercolors, he rendered first the essential spatial structure of a scene, generally in neutral tint, 
and brighten the areas within with needed chromatic details, often with the texture of hatching to areas he wanted to bring forward. And as time passed, he infused into these a kind of expressionistic drama, giving his forms and color a libidinous thrust and power. The intention here was to reconstruct the essence of a scene and produce a reincarnated panel. In the process, the source image was transformed into an art image. The character of this transformation depended on the character of the intention. You can see a series of such shifts in the paintings and watercolors of Ram Kinta. Even more so in his sculpture. In his sculpture, he reconstructed the source image even in his patently realistic works. Most people who have seen him work on his lively portrait heads will confirm that the final phase of each consisted in his destruction of the measured image and its complete reconstruction from memory. This redoing or umbilical severance gave these works a remote and independent reality of their own. Most of the transformations that have taken place in the Artemides of art professionals during the last 100 or 150 years in different parts of the world are due to such change of intentions. Some of these grow out of old practices, others came out of fresh ideas and innovations. To illustrate the former, let us go back to Cezanne, who is supposed to have said that he wanted to do a poussin out of nature, which was to mean that certain qualities of spatial and formal design that he had observed Poussin, the French neoclassicist painter, had learned from the Italian masters, he wanted to bring into his paintings of nature. Other European artists who came after him had an exposure to a larger variety of art traditions and images through the enormous collections of various categories of art objects that came to be housed in their numerous museums. To the European artist professionals, brought up in the atmosphere of post-Renaissance realist aesthetics, the exposure to art objects that seemed to stand on a realistic or anti-realistic basis serve as an incentive to reaching their own practices and postulates, namely their ways of perception and methods of statement. It may be that they made various mistakes in this process, misconstrued the logic of these images, even embarked on various irrational experiments, but taken together, all this clarified various aspects of our practice and process. The image, the intention, the meaning, the function, viewer response, one after another. Let us, for instance, take the case of cubism. By the sound of it, cubism seems to be conceived, concerned with the European artists effort to emphasize the three-dimensionality of representation as it gained prominence in the age of the Renaissance. But in effect, it was the opposite. It was an effort to deconstruct the three-dimensional image to suit a flat picture space. For this, artists tried to give up or reverse certain conventions of three-dimensional rendering. They reduced surface shading to the edges of objects, reversed certain perspectival conventions like showing the nearer contour or plane as bigger than the distant contour or plane, overlap the outlines of objects to, as it were, dematerialize them 
and undermine their solidity and separateness so necessary to demonstrate the three-dimensionality of an object group. All these devices were used in the narrative paintings of the previous day in different parts of the world where narration was multifocal and this called for diverse kinds of spatial adjustments. The Renaissance realism was largely unifocal and three-dimensionality and spatial projection and recession were its essential attributes. Cubists tried to liberate their statements from these and give a sense of flatness to the picture plate. But their initial images continued to be unifocal and their deconstruction of the three-dimensionality had no consistent logic. So most of the analytic cubist paintings were a loose field of disconnected contour lines without any definite sense of visual unity. Was this an unprofitable exercise? By no means. It taught artists to dismantle object shapes and restructure them, made alternative representation of a natural form or a group of forms by forming suggestive, fusing suggestive fragments. This last is at the bottom of what we call synthetic cubism, where various such fragments are fused together to become a composite form. As in a breakfast table of Picasso or Graf, which attains a singular iconic identity and does not remain a loose repository of various objects, a loaf of bread, a bowl of fruit, a bottle of wine, newspaper, guitar, etc., etc. These exercises lead us to focus our attention on the mysterious coalescence of various object presences in our everyday world, in our mixed up streets, in our shadowy interiors, which we often miss when our practical minds itemize their components. Cubism was not fated to last, as it was in essence a series of explorations in the middle space between object presenters and their representation. But it opened up the art horizons. It altered the character of representation by simplifying it on one side to the basic physicalities of the art image, shapes, colors, planes, rhythm, etc. On another side, it made it complex with the multiplicity of references to objects or the meaning or ideas the object symbolized or their emotional content. This led further to the monitoring of these references, taking them from the rational to the irrational, from the logical to the absurd. It led to the emergence of an amazing variety of images and intentions, which was supported from behind by a great diversity of cross-cultural encounters. Broadly speaking, these encounters were part, beat and end part of a big change in the global cultural scene that started somewhere in the middle of the 16th century. A sudden rise in transcontinental travel and commerce brought people of different cultural orientations face to face and each group interrogated the life patterns, languages, arts and beliefs of another and in the process re-evaluated their own. A general consensus arrived at, at the end of these re-evaluations with regard to the nature of the world they live in, the institutions they have desired, the ideals they cherish, the objectives they have chosen to follow, built as it were the basis of what we call now modernity, which provided the 
and is springboard for further progress in knowledge, methods of communication, creative expression, patterns of life and thought in various parts of the world. With diverse inputs, the modern cultural situation was fluid and many-sided and gave special importance to innovation. Some even thought that innovation was an essential trait of modernity and made bold to declare that modern artists and writers should disown their forebears. These innovations ran on different tracks. Some were concerned with the details of practice or style, like those of some post-impressionists who sought resource from the work style of another time or place. One of Mechia's style benefited from the lessons it learned from Byzantine mosaics and Japanese prints. Matita's painting <coughs> owed a lot to his familiarity with Middle Eastern miniatures. In his paintings of the Langular Nudes, Modigliani was influenced by the figuratives, figuration of cycladic sculpture near a home. Rabindranath's paintings held similarities with various aspects of primitive art. Picasso, with his enormous technical facility and visual intelligence, played by turns the role of El Greco, Toulouse Lautrec, or Iberian and Greek primitives. But his responses to African and Oceanic art gave an enormous push to his innovative skills drive him into adventurous distortions, some highly erotic or expressionistic, some amusing, some bizarre. Innovations of some other artists were concerned with the essentials or the building blocks of perception and their uses in image making, like in the very illusionistic exercises of the artist. On another side, the so-called pop artists brought down the search of on their source images from the museum to the marketplace. The concern of others ranged from the purely visual to the ideographic, from the realistic to the surrealistic. The concept of modernity carries within it the notion of the growth of a common body of ideas and institutions through the interaction of various cultural groups. It also carries within it a notion of continuous progress, a kind of forward evolution. Frequent advances in technology and scientific knowledge that unlocked newer and newer methods of production and communication and made ever so noble interpretations of the character of facts and forces of nature supported this. So, from time to time, artists too speculated about such drastic changes and novelty. Some thought that all regional styles will disappear and will be replaced by a uniform international style. Others prophesied that representational art will make way for abstraction. With the passage of time, some changes have certainly taken place, but they have not all been absolute. There are areas of art and design that can be called international, depending on the wideness of their appeal and usage. But group styles too are cherished because of their linguistic specialities, namely intimate responses of human individuals or groups to their environment and history. Similarly, all art has not become abstract, but applied to various purposes and environments, different kinds of abstraction have come to be. In fact, all of these considerations and classifications are the outcome of the realist aesthetic that found wide acceptance in Europe and the extensive literature that has grown around it. Here, art is the visible artist's 
the visual artist responds to the actual appearance of nature and the various forms this response results in. So, correspondence to the natural image was important to the art image. At a certain time, any deviation from this was attributed to the artist's deficiency of vision or technique. Now, in more informed and permissive circumstances, it is attributed to various changes in intentions, including some that take it beyond the umbilical connection between the source image and the art image, or the thing represented to its representation. These changes in intentions doubtless introduces changes in art educational programs. We may give some attention here to the art program that Kalabhavana, the art department of this institution, first visualized. It is widely known that it was planned to be different from those of the official art schools. Strangely enough, the rethinking started within one of these official art schools, the Government School of Arts and Crafts, Calcutta. Its principal, E.B. Shavel, initiated it and persuaded Abhinandan Nath to be his accomplice. They both felt that for all the good points, its good points, these schools did not offer what the country needed. Their teaching programs failed to give their students a sound exposure to the country's cultural inheritance and its enormous variety of art skills. Nor did they keep them informed about the running changes in the world art scene and stuck to the rigidities of the earlier academic realist schools. But for all their good intentions, they did not outline any comprehensive educational strategy. <laughs> this task fell on the shoulders of Nandalal Bose, whom Rabindranath brought to Shantaniket to start an art program in Kalabhavan. Though he did not have the scholarship or the literary skills of either Havel or Abhinandranath, he was a highly resourceful artist who had a gainful association with two exceptional art connoisseurs and thinkers, Okakura Fakuzo and Ananda Kumar Swami, whose views had a big impact on his educational ideas. The former had impressed upon him that the original vision of an artist depended a lot on his ability to use his traditional skills and responses to represent his environment. He learned from Kumaraswamy that a country's art language came out of the total interactive panorama of its arts and crafts. So he wanted his students to get familiar with the various bands of this panorama to get introduced to its full spectrum. He even went further. He had realized that each kind of art expression had its own kind of growth spectrum. He tried to impress upon them that an understanding of these two will increase their resourcefulness. Although he did not believe in the sharp differentiation of high and low art, he was sure that the quality of the former depended a lot on the richness and diversity of the latter. So, if artists wanted to improve the art scene, it fell within their responsibility to service all its component strands. This was certainly a large objective. The intention here was the refurbishment of the total visual environment and the creation of sensitive art workers who could do it. The main focus was not confined to, the, to the answering the demands of the existing professional scene. Naturally, it conformed to the original educational philosophy of Vishwabharati, which sought to change and improve the country's cultural scene rather than serve its running behests. Whether 
Kalabana's recent present program has a comparable perspective is something to ponder about. Or is it happy to be a limited professional school? The horses of food in our national educational scene will not apparently permit it to be anything more. The new tribe of planners want all objectives to be small and specific. For all their managerial rhetoric, they are more concerned to train a person to do a small job well than to make him think big. The professional scene itself has undergone a lot of change. Formerly, creative artists worked to satisfy initially their need for self-expression and hoped that their works will be appreciated by connoisseurs and find favor with knowledgeable private collectors or art museums. Another category of artists went into the field of design of goods and commodities, communication and publicity. Today, the field of public communication has increased enormously and its technology has become more sophisticated. Creative artists too have succumbed to their charms. Digital imaging, animation, public display or installation have now become legitimate areas of expression for both artists and media men. But work of the media men being end-oriented and often backed by studies in viewer response are generally more innovative and exciting compared to the work of artists <coughs> whom uh, the, whose works seem amateurish as they are trained in institutions that have no facilities of their kind. This linking up of the fields of creative and communication art is in a sense a fortunate circumstance. The field of communication is today much larger and more resourceful than it was at any time. Its tools and technology too are more sophisticated and cover an enormous spectrum from personal communication to public media, even varieties that reach out into space. Digital technology has given a new dimension to graphics, their design, display and storage. Communication arts are no more confined to cross publicity anymore as they once were. They sell ideas as well as commodities. And to do this, they inform, explain and inspire. They employ a whole battery of talents, including some highly creative ones. These days, you find among the writers of advertising copy and film scripts budding poets and novelists as they have now a larger elbow room for innovation and literary artifice. Also, there are in this field inventive graphic artists and animators. If the field of communication arts is so wide, you might ask me, where is this special space for the creative men? It is in the field of fresh exploration of the actual environment to restore and give additional body to the stored up experiences and discover new ones. The communication media one uses ideas or images that are current and have an existing penumbra of reference that people can easily respond to but they are liable to go stale by repetition. New ideas and images have to take their place and this is where the creative artists can play a big role provided they develop side by side with their exploration of the actual environment for such experiences an equal understanding of the new communication tools and an ability to handle them with ease. In today's circumstances, a fine arts institution will do well to be or, or at least have a school of visual communication where 
there will be adequate facilities that can be used by creative and communication artists and where they can interact and push their performance to high levels. If Nandalal thought in terms of an art and craft panorama at one time, to refine the visual culture of his time, this is what we can do to contribute to some extent to the enrichment of our present scene. Thank you.